Good morning. Welcome here to our important this morning, who is regretfully unable to attend. And, you know, we miss Barb any day that she's not able to be at work, but particularly breakfast at Sky Days, we feel her absence because now we have no coffee and no cinnamon buns. So she wanted me to apologize and uh, uh, give her uh, regrets for the meeting today. So today we're really fortunate to have Dr. Kirsten Gerhold here with us. She's a pediatric rheumatologist. She runs the GRA clinic at Children's Hospital. So we, those of us that worked at Children's knew her in that capacity, but she's here today talking about pain because she has a special interest in pain in children. So Kirsten, sorry about the coffee and cinnamon buns, but welcome here. We're very happy to have you with us this morning. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation um, and welcome. Um, I'm going to present um, what, what we are doing at the moment, mostly at Children's, but we hope to spread that out. So that is why I think I'm very, very happy to be able to present here um, about every child, every time, our commitment to prevent and relieve pain. I have no in conflict of interest. These are my objectives to understand the regulatory perspective of pain management today. I think many but just, I think very, very few people actually know about that um, to understand why pain in uh, children matters and to learn about every child every time. What are the regulatory perspectives? Um, there was a uh, UN convention on narcotic drugs actually in 1961 saying that the medical use of opioid medication is indispensable for the relief of pain and um, that adequate provision of opioids for medical purposes is a mandate. It was back 1961. The International Association of the Study of Pain had a summit in 2010 and stated with data of the WHO, that 5 billion people live in countries with low or no access to controlled medicines and have no or insufficient access to pain treatment. And that was 2010. There are severe restrictions on the availability of opioids critical to pain management. And I'm just not talking all about opioids today, but I think this is important to know um, how pain management is seen at the moment throughout the world. Um, there are major lacks of national policies to regulate the management of pain as a health problem, including an inadequate, uh, inadequate level of research and education that has changed somewhat, particularly here in Canada. And there's major deficits in knowledge of um, in health professionals, you know, how to manage pain um, adequately. And people still are not quite aware of the real problem of chronic pain um, in um, many, many people, um, and that it's a real health issue, um, a system issue actually, um, coming up more and more. They um, released the Declaration of Montreal in 2010. That was through this pain summit. Um, and they gave out three articles. Article one is, it's the right of all people to have access to pain management without discrimination. Article two is, it is the right of people in pain to receive acknowledgement of their pain and to be informed about how it can be assessed and managed. And Article 3 is, um, it is the right of all people with pain to have access to appropriate assessment and treatment of the pain by adequately trained healthcare professionals. And this became actually a legal status. So it's not just a little declaration anymore. It's actually legal that we have to have, that we have to provide um, appropriate care for pain. And this is not only true for 
governments and so on, it's also true for all clinicians, um, which was not all the time the case, particularly not in the prior declarations. This is what we, how the world looks today from the perspective of opioid access. Um, when you see, this is um, the opioid which is available, the milligram per patient available in palliative care. And that is the percentage of what's actually needed. So we have 3,000 3, times more, or 300 times more, I'm sorry, um, access to opioids here in Canada and um, in the US. And if you look here, these are fairly under um, under treated these, you know, um, they don't have much access here. Um, if you look at the percentages. Why does pain in kids matter? And I think I'm um, talking to many people of you here who, who have, you know, who treat people and um, patients in pain, kids in pain. Um, so I think you all know about that. Um, this, this seems to be very simple, but it's actually still not by everybody believed that children of all ages have pain, that they have the capacity to actually perceive pain, even in, in, in neonates. Um, and they are much more exposed to pain because they injure themselves much more. Um, and they are in a phase where they le learn about how to cope with pain and with each episode they actually experience, um, and they learn the skills either to magnify or to reduce the distress about this um, experience. And pain is an everyday experience, as we all know. Um, we all um, experience injuries, injuries, acute diseases, chronic diseases, and um, many of us may have had some uh, contact with palliative care. Um, I don't know if you know how many needle pokes a kid has within the first year of life, but these are many, many, many due to vaccinations. Um, procedures like dental care as a normal procedure has nothing to do with even being sick. Um, and then surgeries is another expo possible exposure. We know today that poorly controlled pain in preterm newborns may impair children's brain maturation, may actually impair children's later development, and may lead to worse outcomes of severe illnesses. So if we don't control pain adequately, even in, in neonates, um, they may have worse outcomes. They may actually even die from their severe disease much earlier um, or much more likely than a patient where the pain is controlled. And we know as well that poorly controlled pain actually alter our nerve system, our, you know, the, the nerve system which is developing and it influences the processing of pain um, for the rest of the lifespan. This is actually shown as well, um, not that recently. Um, and central sensitization of the body to, to pain that can develop and may increase pain experience in the future, um, may lead to fear and avoidance of healthcare later in life. I mean, actually, the not that so many um, people don't want to vaccinate their children, the main cause was actually shown to be needle pokes and the fear of the needle pain, not the vaccination itself. Um, and then this leads also um, to susceptibility of um, chronic pain. And chronic pain actually is something um, which really matters. Um, about 20 or 100 um, children with or without an underlying condition experience chronic pain, um, either with headaches, abdominal pain, or musculoskeletal pain. And it may actually become a disorder. So disease itself in about five of 100 um, children. So this is 5%. I think type 1 diabetes ha has a, um, has a um, incidence and prevalence of 1%. So um, this is 
this is actually or one hundred thousand even. This is this is much more than these rare diseases where we have very standardized treatment for. Um, and these kids, they suffer from um, absence from school, sports, social life. Um, when we take data um, um, from you know from Manitoba, then we have probably around ten thousand kids affected. Chronic pain is known to persist from childhood into adulthood. Um, we know it's a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in adulthood. And we know it's a significant um, economic burden, actually, particularly in adults. Um, and when you see it, when you look at these um, numbers, it's it, it just numbers. We don't have a comparator here, um, but it seems to be a lot. Um, so it seems to cause more than cancer, heart disease, and HIV together. Um, and the direct healthcare costs were actually estimated with over six billion dollars per year, and these are Canadian numbers. So um, the stra strategic priority of um, pain was actually um, established in 2017, um, and that is when we started with our um, program every child every time. These are our goals. We want to raise awareness of the importance of pain relief and prevention in children. We want to provide tools and recommendations for adequate um, management of all types of pain. So procedural pain, acute pain, chronic pain, pain cancer, pain palliative care. Um, we want to provide um, education on pain assessment and management for all health professionals, but also for patients and families to be able to advocate so that they are actually um, able to advocate for themselves. Um, we want to conduct clinical research, um, and this is something I'm just um, setting up right now um, together with some people involved. Um, and what we want to do is we want to achieve child kind certification in the long term. Childkind is, um, um, is an organization um, that wants to induce or in, introduce um, the comfort promise into um, healthcare facilities. Um, and this is this is their principles that they are working with. They want to have us, when we, if we want to apply for a certification, um, they want to have us um, a program-wide policy on pain management. Um, we need to teach staff and families how to use pain, how to assess pain appropriately, how to treat with evidence-based medicines, and um, it should be evaluated on an ongoing basis as well. So we have, we would need to show that, that we are all doing that. Um, this is how we are working at the moment. Um, the program has a steering committee and the people on the steering committee um, have very much experience in, you know, policy, writing, writing policies, making policies in education, in pain assessment, pain treatment, and in quality. So we are working very closely together with the, for, for instance, with the child health quality team. Um, and these are our overall goals. And currently, um, we were or we, we, we are working on these um, parts. Um, Procedural pain is currently in the process um, that we set up um, uh, policies around that. Um, chronic pain, some of you may know um, that we are working on that part. Um, and I will introduce you a little bit further in the other initiatives. Um, so we had an audit and actually already 2017, wow, um, time is fast. Um, it was an audit from on the wards um, to, 
assess the current pain experience from my families. Um, and um, we did, part of it was a structured interview, part of it um, was a chart review. Um, and we had a staff survey and some of you may have been um, responded to that survey to see what our needs are, what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, that was more an open question survey. Um, the award audit, we, we included um, in total 83 patients. Um, and this was the main reason for the hospital visit. So you can see that, may, um, that most of the kids were actually admitted for acute illnesses, which makes actually sense. Um, and these were all the neonatal wards, accident injuries, surgeries. And this was the present of pain. In yellow, you will find um, the patients who were on the wards less than 24 hours, um, and in green um, for more than 24 hours. Um, and these were the children in pain. Um, so pain is present in about 80% of all patients. And that was throughout the, the ward pretty much the same. Um, and this is what they reported. So 10% of these patients in pain reported mild pain, 35 moderate pain, and 55 severe pain. And this is either by proxy or um, real by the children um, measurement or assessment on a numeric rating scale. Um, the causes now, as expected, was not the acute, acute illness only, it was mainly procedures, and that is um, particular needle pokes. And that is um, what was found in other, we, our data are very much consistent with other hospital audits. Um, we actually adapted our hospital audit to other um, audits which were done before. Um, what we got out of this um, audit was the most prevalent pain is procedural pain. Pain assessment is not standardized at the moment, may need to be standardized. We, need, we may need to choose the right tools um, and the right scheduling. Um, and um, medical treatment is not standardized either. So there's not like an approach, we always use this medication or we always use that medication um, in a standardized way. Um, and um, we didn't also measure so far um, much of our responses when we give a, pa um, a patient medication. Um, there's often no response um, measured. Um, Non-medical treatment, though, has been fairly well used, and I think that is mostly due um, to involvement of our child-like people, which is actually they are, they are doing an amazing job in, in the hospital. Um, and um, I think they introduced a lot of distraction techniques and stuff like that. Um, other resources may be optimized, like acute pain service, for example, which is available as well. Um, These were comments we got from the patients and caregivers. Um, so sometimes they find, I mean, there might be actually unnecessary procedures. And I think this is something we really need to think about. Um, there was inadequate um, pain control mentioned. And it, even, you know, that some people still, met, you know, questioning whether child is in pain, I think this is something we really have to work on. And we got a lot of comments, you know, where people were very, very satisfied um, with pain management. And I think that was actually something I, I really like to see. And um, even without any further or prior um, um, management, uh, you know, that we, that we did anything. So pain is taken seriously. Um, staff is caring, cooperative, understanding. Um, they are responding on time um, and offer various distraction tools um, and non-medical management approaches. This, these were the people, there were many people involved in this audit. So the staff survey um, 
was an online survey and these were the people who participated. So you can see physiotherapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists, actually quite a few, mostly nursing. And I was kind of surprised about so many physicians being involved, actually. Um, so one question was, um, do you feel adequately trained in pain management? And many actually said, no, we don't. And these were not only administrative people. These were actually people who care for kids with pain. Um, so I think that's something to think about um, and to look further into it. Um, this is maybe something, this was the approach they gave us and I found there's some, you know, what 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 will you do when a when a patient is in pain, you know? And um, I think I liked a few. I think or we should work on a few things much more, which came up really, like you know, using anticipatory approaches and planning. What will you do if a if a child, um, you know, develop pain? Um, creating a modification of plan, for instance. And I think this might be something you may need to um, consider as well, or you may already consider, you know, in, in terms of when you have um, treatment, um, or when you treat a child with physiotherapy or occupational therapy, for instance. Um, these might be the challenges of pain management implementation. Um, I think, this is something we all, you know, will face, particularly when we go into the education part um, with, with our strategic priorities about pain management. One is not enough time is a huge thing. Um, not enough staff is another huge thing. And it's understandable if you, if you look at the wards, for example, how they work at the moment. Um, missing equipment. And then the question of how do you get people buying in? Um, this is this is something we really have to work on, I think. So this is this is was one comment, and I I, I chose two comments actually here. Um, so one was my perspective. My perspective is staff do not place importance on procedural pain control, and some feel it may be a disruption of their workflow time. A greater understanding of the impact poor pain control can have may help improve compliance, along with reducing barriers for using topical anesthetics. So that is on procedural pain. Um, and then there's still this questioning of about you know, well, do neonates feel pain? Um, in, in this time right now. Um, these are suggested resources we would like to implement and use as well. Um, so we want to implement guidelines, standard of practice, standing orders, um, standardized order sheet to make it easier in, in, in general. Um, I think this is a nice idea to separate treatment rooms um, from, from patient rooms, which is a space issue. Um, and then I think it's it's important that came actually up from the staff survey as well, you know, to have a resource person, you know, who may be actually um, available on the ward or, you know, everywhere in, in each facility, you know, to talk about how should we manage that the best way, you know, what, what can we do? I think that's um, that was a very, very wise suggestion. Um, and then, you know, to provide much more and better material um, to educate patients, to give them actually the tools, you know, to advocate for their children. Um, this is now the initiative we have on um, needle, pain, uh, needle pain. Um, led by Stasa Verrucas, and she's an um, uh, intensivist, um, uh, section head of, um, uh, of the um, intensive care unit. Um, and she came up with the term of a bundle of care, which we want to um, implement. Um, so we 
Um, it starts with, we should ask the parent and child what has work, worked before. Um, when we are talking about a procedure, um, comfort position, distraction, and then topical anesthetics or sucrose for an infant. These will be the, this will be the bundle of care. They are working currently on um, implementing, setting up um, a nursing initiated um, order um, so that this doesn't have to go through the physicians all the time, which takes time and doesn't make sense really. Um, this is what they want to look at. Um, so all kind of needle pokes at the moment. And this is where they start at. They decided to start at Children's Hospital on the, on the wards, but we want to spread it out. So it's it's not, I think this, this should be clear here. Um, we start somewhere, but we want to spread it out. And actually, eventually, my dream is to go conventionally and not even just just in Winnipeg, um, but we want you all being part of this um, process um, and being part of um, part of the program. Um, and then chronic pain. I have no clue about the time right now. Oh, oh perfect. Um, so. People who know me a little bit may know that that this is my what I really like to deal with um, because I like I think it's mainly because I like the stories of these kids um, and and yeah that's that's mainly it um, so there's a position statement actually from the American Pain Society from 2012. Um, which states the primary goals in chronic pain. Um, and it's not improvement of pain. We are not talking about pain a lot in follow-up visits in our clinic. Um, it's mainly about functioning and, um, and quality of life, whatever that means for each individual. Um, but we know that we have to involve um, all domains of the biopsychosocial model of pain, um, which means mental health, physical health, and social health. Um, so interdisciplinary clinics are really considered as a standard of care for patients with chronic pain at the moment. Um, I established the clinic um, in October 2015. It's just a half day clinic. Um, it's not, it doesn't have any additional funding. Um, uh, Christy Wittmeyer joined me, I think in 2016 already, 2016 or 2017, <laughs> um, as a physiotherapist in this clinic. Um, and Dr. Anang was part of it for a year last year. Um, um, we have been seeing, so it started just with musculoskeletal pain because I saw, you know, when I came here, I came August 2014, so I thought, um, I saw, you know, patients with sure rheumatologic diseases, but then more and more referrals came in for kids with mechanical pain, and then eventually more and more, you know, I saw more and more referrals with, with, for kids with chronic pain. Um, so that is how it started. And I thought, so, okay, so I had some experience. Um, I set up a chronic pain clinic like that as well in Germany before I came here. Um, so I thought, oh, okay, we need to do something about it. Um, so I you know, dedicated time for this clinic, Friday afternoons. Um, and then more, and pe more people got interested in that and sent more and more referrals, not only for musculoskeletal pain, um, but also for headaches and abdominal pain. So I have a broad spectrum now of, um, of patients with all types of pain. Um, this is what I mentioned before. Um, yeah, Ke Kelly uh, Kittle is also very closely related to us. And I think we built up, a I'm just looking at Corinne right now because I know her. <laughs> so we're trying to build up, you know, the, the um, close relationship with, with um, um, the physiotherapists who are dealing here with um, the patients we sent here. Um, and we have a close collaboration with psychology and um, social work as well. Um, but again, no official funding, so I don't have an admin, I don't have a nursing um, staff. I, 
you know, there's, and if I'm not there, the clinic would be, wouldn't be there at the moment, that it's how it's set up right now. Um, so this is not sustainable. Um, it's structured right now that we have an intake visit, then an educational session, which we have to think a little bit about it. Um, so that would be the intake visit is usually a visit of at least two hours. That is how it's working in other pain clinics as well. Um, uh, you go into the story, you do, in the, and you do a physical exam, and then we usually provide the kids with some first suggestions. And our first suggestions are usually all the family has to stop asking about pain not to focus on the pain, um, why the patient still can complain, there's nothing against that. Uh, but then the family shouldn't go into it further, but should rather distract um, the, the child. Um, and then the other prescription is usually um, to do something enjoyable every day, um, um, to, to find you know, something good for them. Uh, which they can use as a distraction tool when they are much more pain. Um, and then an education session, we have to we have to reconsider that concept a little bit um, because patients keep canceling. Um, <laughs> they don't want to get educated, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, where we actually went into the um, biopsychosocial social model of pain. Um, we, usually we have, when they show up, we usually have a lot of fun, actually. We, we explain you know, acute pain versus chronic pain with examples, you know, and it's it's kind of a nice session, but we will see. <laughs> um, and then we have follow-up visits, and these are our prescriptions. Um, yeah, so don't miss school um, and stay physically active is something we often have to work with these kids together um, because that's not something they can just do right away after being not at school for two years or something like that. Um, we offer interdisciplinary case conferences. This is something like um, advertisement right now. Um, if you have patients which are severely infected, I'm very, very happy to discuss them in an um, interdisciplinary team with nursing, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, um, psychology, um, and many others. Um, and um, we had a few where we invited now community pediatricians as their primary care providers um, and people from Sky, Corinne came over, and you know, so other people um, came over. Um, sports medicine is involved, Dr. Manuel Zedok is involved. And so it's, it's, it's a very, I think it's a very nice approach. The most painful thing actually in these, you know, when you, when you manage these patients is to give them different messages. And, um, and patients will use that, unfortunately, not on a, probably not even consciously, um, but we have to be all on the same page and provide all the same messages. And that is why we came up with these conferences. Um, so they are, every, I think, every fourth Thursday, every other month, from two to three. And we had telephone dials, dial-ins as well, so it's possible too. Um, what we have done in, um, also, I think that was also 2017, no, 2018, 2017, no, 2018. Um, we got an, um, that was actually Chris B, um, who applied for a patient in, um, engagement grant of, um, at the Center for Healthcare Innovation. And we met a group of patients and their parents um, to ask them, what do you want to have us researched and what are your questions um, and how do you see this research to be conducted it was actually very interesting we had a, a parent group and a, you know a separately a, um, a patient group um, and Catherine McDonald who is an art therapist um, led um, the um, children's group and um, she um, um, work with them in, as you know in, in, in the model of the tree of a life tree of life um, so the roots are where we come from the stem is where we where we live our present what we choose to do um, our value our skills um, what we want to what we hope for 
um, and um, what supports us. It was, um, and they came out, um, we wish to give to others. So th these are actually things um, that came up and they, they made these wonderful trees. Um, it was, that was really helpful. Um, and this little thing here, this little mountain here, <laughs> um, is anything you don't want to be defined by. Um, this was from the sessions. And these were the results of the workshop. Um, so there, there were a lack of resources to assist with chronic pain and awareness, diagnosis and management for multiple stakeholders, including teachers actually, um, and, and healthcare providers um, and other youth. Um, and they, the youth felt, felt alone, which is often in, I think often in chronic disease is the case. Um, and that was actually very interesting. So the parents thought they know, you know, what, what everything is about. And um, that's actually not true. Um, it, was, it was a really, really interesting dis discussion about that. Um, um, and the, the kids really in, enjoyed the opportunity to get together and, and discuss together what their problems are and to share their experience. Um, so we want to do that further. We want to um, engage our youth further. Um, we want to have them now reviewed resources we um, put together um, on our website. And I'll show you the website in a minute. Um, um, for chronic pain. And we want them, so these are these are part of the resources. So there's a toolkit actually um, available and then resources on our main, own website. And we want you know to feature then these resources which are which were evaluated by our kids. So this was all patient engagement and we are just working on another um, application together um, to set up um, a prospective cohort of these patients and we want to have youth involved um, in setting up this cohort, this cohort as well. We finally, um, that took a little while, but now it's actually a great um, um, process and communication. Um, we, we involved the um, HSC communication um, uh, site. Um, we have very close contact to um, the CRIM communication um, uh, communication people and um, the department communication um, site. And we all together, so this is first our website. Um, it's under, you can find it under HP, H, TPPS, sorry, everychildeverytime.ca. Um, I actually, I don't know, I, I think I skipped that. We can look at it maybe later. Um, there are summaries for all these um, um, pain parts at the moment. And then there's a resource part um, which provides a lot of resources on each topic. And we, we hope to get more into it and we hope to get a lot of feedback from everybody um, to improve this site. And this is what actually the, the communication um, people all together um, came up with. Um, and these slides are particularly um, created by Erin Hill um, from CRIM and the department. Um, these are actually slides at the moment that are shown on uh, the screens when you when you walk into HSC. Um, so one against one for for the comfort promise, one for distraction um, for, for comfort, sorry, for comfort positioning, um, one for distraction, one for sugar water, and one for numbing cream. So this was the first thing. Um, that we could set up with them together to make the initiative a little bit broader and more known. We wanted to come here as well. We were not we were supposed to let's start here. So we, you know, 
So we will we will get going. Um, we don't want to leave you out here. <laughs> so this is this is our team and our support, our patients will I mean for sure our referring physicians. Um, and then um, I'm very much supported at the moment by Heidi um, in the past by Rina. Um, without this support, I think um, nothing much would have happened. Um, these are the people of the steering committee at the moment. Um, you can see um, Sandy Taylor is, you know, um, a nurse educator, um, and we both are sharing the lead um, of this initiative. Um, and then the department, Inge, is a very uh, great support for us and you know and, um, putting everything together um, that's fantastic um, people from CRIM are very very supportive yeah you can see the you can see the list um, and then Stata is leading, leading um, the needle pain group together with Susan Clark Susan is um, um, a pediatric resident um, the little nameplate was made was created by um, Geisha, a good friend of mine um, yeah, this is mainly it. And then I think some of you may know Carl, um, who's, um, who was a psychologist, um, who is one of the lead in um, pain worldwide. Um, so he, I think without him, we wouldn't be here like where we are right now, because he initiated much more before the strategic priority started. He um, initiated actually a kind of a work group, um, kind of an inter, I think he, they, they, at that time, they named it interest group for pain. Um, they met once a month or something like that. And very, very many little um, initiatives um, were growing out of that. So that was very, very helpful. That's mainly it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. That's interesting to hear about all that work. I was thinking about my, I work mostly with babies, yes. premature babies, and they can be pretty traumatized by all those needle pokes. So we definitely do see it here in our treatment sessions and uh, something we always have. I always want to see the baby before the pediatrician, that's for sure. Uh, is there any questions from the webinar? Any questions from the room or comments? So again, I'm, oh, sorry, Pam. You have to repeat the question. So um, the, the question was about the, the age range and the, I guess, in the chronic pain clinic right now, right? Um, so um, the typical age group is, I would say, 12 to 17. Um, about that, um, we see younger kids from the age of eight on for chronic abdominal pain mainly. Um, I think so. Usually, if you have a career in pain, you start often with um, abdominal pain, and then you go over to musculoskeletal and headaches. And so that's that's often the career. Um, we see some much younger kids. Um, and then I always question really the diagnosis of chronic pain. Um, and we had kids where we had other differential diagnosis um, considered. For instance, um, um, Munchausen by proxy is one. Um, so, and we, you know, or a lot of anxiety in the family. Um, yeah. I think just to mention that right now, this anxiety part today, we don't, I think we even cannot um, distinguish anymore between, we should not distinguish anymore between anxiety and chronic pain. It's so closely related, even pathophysiology, uh, physiological, um, that, that it, it, for me, pain is just a symptom of, other often much more, you know, mental health issues. Mm 
Well, I just had one more question. I know that we see here at Sky Center lots of kids with physical impairments. Like I'm thinking cerebral palsy, GMF, GMFCS four and five. Do you see any kids like that in your clinic? Thank you for that question. Actually, I should have mentioned that. Um, so I think um, so. Gail um, is is one of the nurses who was on the. Um, who who start you know who already started in this interest group um, um, when when Carl set it up and and she's still a member um, of the pain conferences we have of the case conferences um, and I think through her you know I get we get more and more referrals for kids with muscular dystrophy spastic um, problems and um, it's it's very 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 interesting um for me as well um and i i you know i started to work a little bit together with um dr casey and you know we kind of reached out a little bit um and i think um I, Gail would probably be able to to tell you a little bit more about um our influence you know if we have any influence or not on these kids and and their families um some of them come back you know um and and seem to be happy with what we with, with our approach um we, we cannot do much but we can you know give a few little tips to to change which may actually make bigger changes for the families um we haven't uh, sometimes i miss the feedback how it works so um, so we need to get more feedback and in this way. Sometimes I get um, patients from um, neurology um, with myopathies, for instance. Um, I can remember one little guy um, who was really much in pain and, you know, I developed more anxiety, developed tics around the anxiety um, and who was very unhappy at school just because he couldn't keep up with other people. And what I did for this kid actually was I went to the school um, and it was a wonderful school and we had a little session together with the kids, you know, what it means to be different and, and you know, that they are actually not different and so on. And I think it helped him very much. And he's now, he, I mean, he runs, he runs now 5Ks and stuff like that. So it's very amazing, actually. So that was, that was I mean, sure, I tell you here the positive parts, right? <laughs> <They are. laughs> but, but yeah, it was, that's, that's the fun part of this thing. Great. Well, I know you have to get back to your resident and your clinic. So thank you for making time for us today. And we really appreciated your presentation. Thanks again. And everybody just make sure that you signed in on the sheet.